Hey guys, it's Vince. Today in this video, we're going to be taking a look at a vendor rewiring a CNC controller for one of his clients. And apparently he did not know or realize that this particular client would be contacting me. Um, I actually was contacted right after this video was made. Um, and it's interesting because he did not contact me in direct review of the system, meaning that he found issues with the system. It was when he showed me pictures that I confronted what I was seeing and brought it to his attention. Something here is wrong and I cannot wait to cover what you are about to see. So let's jump right in and get right to it. Hello everyone. This is a retrofit for CNC Electronics for a customer. You're watching a little over six hours of work compressed into a little bit over 14 minutes. I'm not exactly certain why he feels it's necessary to tell you the length of time and labor it takes to do this job, at least for him. But just to be certain that you guys understand, I would hope many of you wouldn't want this to be a race in terms of getting it done, but be done at whatever time it takes to do it right to produce a stable production robot. That's where, once again, I come in. And rather than me tell you about clients, I actually just got a message from this potential client and they're asking me questions, which I think says a lot because as I was being raised, my father always told me, you know, people are going to judge you by the people you hang out with. So I'll just show you the uh, excerpt from the email and you guys be your own judge. This is about how much time that goes into a simple CNC electronics retrofit and what is involved. Guys, there are very few simple CNC retrofits, mainly because you have to go through and identify each individual component and then use corrective action in terms of how you're going to rectify if a component is a potential issue for that robot's stability. Now, many vendors, him included, will go through the general components that they understand and stop there. They don't go through and look at each individual component and how it's going to possibly deter from the effectiveness of the robot they're creating. We'll see that as we go through. The customer provided the electronics inside of an enclosure and a VFD for a spindle and a wireless pendant. Just a brief point, guys. I do not work with third-party components. I've been asked that numerous times by potential clients. And what that simply means is if you purchase your components by yourself and then think you can hire me to assemble your controller, I will not do that. And the main reason I don't do that is because I can't warranty anything, number one. Number two, in the event a component doesn't work, it leaves the door open to have kind of a sketchy atmosphere as far as did I do something wrong to the component? or did it actually come you know in that way and that's something I don't like to deal with as far as questioning because again integrity is everything to me and we're working with these type of components there are too many what ifs and the variables go up and up the more hands that touch these units now that being said there are vendors namely ones like this that will gladly take your money regardless of where you purchase everything and start to what I call tinker. And you'll see why I use that word as we go through this. And as this gets deeper in, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about where integrity becomes an issue. Since the pendant works independently from the electronics, I decided not to test this. This would needlessly increase the time and cost for the retrofit. Needlessly increase the cost of the retrofit, testing the pendant. Well, I have to disagree with that because again, we need to validate that everything works prior to me sending it back. As a vendor, number one, that would be the smartest thing to do to protect myself, to say, hey, naturally, you sent me this, this is working, provide a video, let the client know, hey, you know what, this is working, or if it's not working and I can't find a driver for it, which is many times the case if you're dealing with overseas uh, pendants, this is something to bring to their attention. 
Um, why he feels this way, once again, I have no idea, but we must be in a more transparent fashion when you're telling someone you're doing a retrofit because if they provide the components, I'm sure that this gentleman, whoever he was, expected you to test everything to make sure he would receive basically a system that he paid for in a plug and play format. The way the spindle was hooked up for turning it on and off automatically was actually cutting the power to the VFD. Okay, so we know already that that's wired incorrectly and with good reason he should review that. The interesting part is he never discusses if that VFD actually came with the proper double shielded cable to provide power to his spindle. Um, again, all components that the system would be using needs to be identified and validated, not just for use, but also for what application we're using them for. Details count, guys. And if this vendor is not identifying that cable, he's missing a direct component that will correlate whether the system is stable or not. Think about what I'm telling you. They briefly do these videos to make content because, again, they're content creators and they're selling components. It's the best way to put it, I think. Uh, wording it any other way would not make any sense logically because the first thing you would identify is if a spindle is wired to be powered on and off by losing power, then you already know the end user most likely is unaware of what cabling to use. And I'm just going down the rabbit hole of logic. So it's interesting he didn't bring any of this up. Connecting the VFD to a signal instead. The controller he was using was an Ethernet smooth stepper controller, which is a pretty nice controller, but I believe this one was faulty. The first thing we need to point out is the fact that this vendor does not sell the Ethernet smooth stepper. I personally do. Um, I also sell the UC400, and I can tell you there's really not much difference on how the ESS is set up. But what it does tell me, and it should tell many of you, is why would you be willing to work on a board you don't sell yourself? That means you're less familiar with that board. That also means that if you encounter any hiccups, then the natural assumption is going to be that you're going to blame the board when it may be just a lack of experience. And it's really interesting to see how this plays out, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. I tried connecting this controller to my computer, which actually altered my Ethernet, because the software recommends using this controller with a computer dedicated solely for controlling a CNC. After many attempts, the ESS Smooth Stepper kept locking up on me. This was probably me overlooking something. Well, we already know with him coming clean and saying it's probably him overlooking something, and the fact that he's actually on Warp 9's website researching his issue, that what I've stated previously about his lack of knowledge due to the fact he doesn't sell these components is becoming evident. And what's really interesting is that he's not taking a huge variable into consideration, and that is his computer itself. And what I mean to say is, Everyone is assuming everyone's PC is set up correctly. It may not be. And that is a huge variable that a lot of guys just don't understand in terms of the level of detail required to really troubleshoot a, an Ethernet controller, a USB controller, whatever other controller you're hooking up. Your computer and how it's set up, looking at the device manager, understanding what software is running in the background, what priorities are set, all of these variables can affect how a device is found or even identified. So if you don't understand this, guess what? You can have a paperweight. And it will look as if it's the device when we just heard him say, well, it could very well be himself. That's someone that's not definitive on the hardware being at fault. Now watch where this is going. It's still very interesting. So I decided to replace the controller with a simpler USB controller. So I'm sure you guys all heard that, and I actually watched this portion of the video twice because I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And I'm going to show you just how true this is, that this potential client of his contacted me with pictures of his system and explained to me, before I even knew this video existed, that this gentleman did this to his system. 
Now, I want to know what you would think as an end user paying somebody supposedly to know more than you, a potential self-proclaimed expert, aka content creator, who would do something like this. Now, am I correct that USB is unstable? Don't take my word for it. Take it from Balzus, who's been in virtually all of my videos as far as his email, reflecting the UC100, which is probably the most premier USB MOSH controller, and its instability when dealing with 5 volts and grounding issues. You guys can read it for yourself. Do you think his board is any different? No. And it's manufactured in China, so we don't even know the quality because we all know how China quality is. And if you don't know, I'll explain it. They do batch production runs. If there is not an end user testing every individual board, they may select maybe one out of every five, one out of every 10. Then they'll test it. If it works, they consider them all good. If you get a bad one, oh, well, we'll send you another one until you get a good one. And if that doesn't work, then oh, well. I mean, you might get your money back. You might not. That's the truth. And seeing this, I can't believe what I'm seeing or hearing, but again, this is something many of you need to see. And this will get even more um, in depth as we go through this, because I think there is still so much here to learn. Let's keep it going. What I'm doing here is really just trying to understand what's going on in the box. Guys, you heard just what I did. Shouldn't he, as the contractor slash content creator, with this whole channel based around this technology, understand what's going on inside a client CNC controller before he takes it upon himself to take a job or wiring it? Isn't that kind of contradictory? Doesn't that kind of stem from the fact that, once again, we're back to the content creator needing content, and trying to take on more jobs to basically learn from. And that's exactly what we see here. They take jobs to learn from using your equipment. And the scariest part is, is that if something happens, or in this case, he decided to swap a perfectly good component out, I'm sure, and ended up basically downgrading a system for a client. I want you to think about what we're seeing here. And think about if you were in this place of the guy who actually contracted to work out. How would you feel? Determine the hole placements for the components. I'll use a hole transfer tool, which puts a little divot. In. It's super interesting to me to point out all of the consistencies and all of these failure videos that I've created with these content creators. And that is just how obvious the points and steps they use to build a controller. I've never had a guy ask me how to use a screwdriver. I've never had a guy ask me what drill to use to mount the, the uh, drives to his chassis. I've never had a guy ask me, hey, uh, what's a pressurized center punch to do whole transfer positions to leave a little divot? Never had those questions. You know what I have questions on? What you see here missing in this controller. How do I ground the system properly? Why is this system not being discussed, not having a ground bus allocation for potentially shielded cables if they're even being used and if they are being used they're all but useless because the shield drains aren't allocated to that ground bus because we already know the ground bus is missing there's no termination on the shield drains nor if they are shielded cables that they're double shielded to mitigate both forms of EMI in both high and low frequency guys these are novice builders at best if you look at his desk there's no way in hell I would ever get anything done if I work like that. There's no way he's going to know what screw goes where. Everything would have to be labeled unless he's going to sit there for three hours just allocating what screw is threaded to what. Think about what you're seeing. You're seeing a guy with a video camera who has a YouTube account and is interested in this technology, and that's where it ends. And the unfortunate part is if many of you don't do your due diligence, you will unfortunately be burned. As we go through this system and we watch this more, once again, it just keeps going down the rabbit hole. Because the NEC doesn't state that you absolutely need wire ferrules. So looking at this, guys, are we to believe that he's going to go back and allocate the shield drains on that cable, if it is shielded at all, to a ground bus bar and install that after the fact? Because what sense would it make to install a ground bus and have to redrill and install inside the enclosure if you understood where that unit comes in play in the system? You would do it logically as you're installing the components and doing the drilling and all that neat stuff. So seeing this, you can already see where it's going, okay? 
once again, content creator, YouTube channel, showing you General Assembly, missing out the direct components that are required for a stable production robot, and yet he's charging someone for this. It's scary. Still have to hold the screws in place while you put the plate in there, but it's much better. Now I'm wiring the drivers to the toroid power supply. My aim is to make sure these wires can be neatly positioned so that the wiring doesn't look so cluttered. It's always very important to discuss the cluttering of wiring instead of discussing how to properly wire and power the G201X drives that he's working with. Had this vendor slash content creator decided to go on Gecko's site, had he had any questions, he could have looked under Power Supply Basics where you would have found this image I'm showing you right here where it reflects using a power distribution star so we can prevent daisy chaining to the drives to supply them proper power. Now anyone who's been in this industry long enough realizes toroid power supplies are not able to supply enough power output terminals for multi-axis systems, namely individual drive systems. So what you end up doing is having to daisy chain power as he's doing here, because there's no power distribution star being used as in the diagram that is attached. Now keep in mind, I want to know in the comments how many of you would be pissed off if you knew you paid a content creator slash experts and he actually presented you a system where you can actually validate that he didn't even follow what's on the website of the manufacturer the drives you're using. I mean, it would kind of be insulting, I think. I know I would feel that way. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are. I also found out that one of the drivers did not work. This is something that the customer mentioned before, but I wanted to test it anyway, just to make sure. And it was verified that this driver was bad. So I decided to take it out. So rather than discussing earlier in this video that the client sent the system in, to not only have it rebuilt, but essentially have a drive tested because he felt one of them was not working, you decided to basically leave that out, go with full system assembly, record everything, and then record you not only wiring every drive, but installing it only to backtrack out, remember the fact that he said he had a bad drive, and then you decide to test it inside the system only to have to remove everything again and make the video longer for your content. I get it. Makes sense. I mean, this is where we're at, guys. It's all about content. And unfortunately, YouTube at this point just can't decipher what's going on with this type of content. They can't decipher at this point what information's real and what it isn't. And the most unfortunate thing is that many of you will find this video if you haven't already and use some of what you're seeing for your own system. And unfortunately, it's, it's kind of toxic. So I'm hoping that we are seeing what not to do. I mean, if you guys have a potentially bad drive, test all of your components prior to mounting them. That's best practice. This way you don't have to do what this content creator is doing. Namely, it's more insulting to post this and act as if you're an authority to some degree, only to find that you're redoing an entire bill because you never tested any of the components to begin with. Time to Hey guys, this is one of the most important parts of the video and it's actually very near and dear to my heart as I was a UPS supervisor when I was going to school and I can tell you learning through them what I learned about packaging. It's so much of a science and engineering in terms of preventing damages. Now, the thing you need to keep in mind is what you're seeing here, while it did go to the client undamaged, so to speak, it doesn't mean he used best practice and he certainly didn't use the packaging guidelines available with UPS, FedEx, or USPS. I can tell you that definitively. Um, all electronic components should have proper baffling within the box internally to prevent high drop G-forces that would potentially damage the components. If he doesn't do that, even if he takes out insurance, like many guys claim, I took insurance out so it's automatically covered. It doesn't work that way. It has to be properly packaged to the guidelines of the carrier. If it's not, you get SOL and they walk away with your money. 
Their goal is not to make this information easily available. It's kind of like buying a car where if you're watching a car commercial, they put that small print at the end of the screen and you barely can read it. It's their principle. They make it known, but they're not going to make it easily known. So these are things that you need to do as a consumer and pay very close attention to or you'll experience potential loss, even if you take insurance out. I've seen it time and time again. Um, again, studying packaging, understanding it, especially if someone's doing mail order, it's essential. You're really efficient with your packaging. It's going to save you money. It's going to save you time. And it's definitely going to keep your clients happy. And luckily, this potential client of his, and when I say potential, after he received his unit, I don't know if he's ever going to go back to him. I doubt that. But again, at least he received it this initial time in working order other than the fact that he did the old switcheroo on the board and then on top of that all the other fallacies that we've seen with him reassembling the system pack up the electronics this set of electronics was a little bit difficult because the vfd was still attached via a signal wire to the enclosure but the package arrived Safe. Okay guys, that wraps up another video and once again, I will keep these videos coming as long as there is something for you to learn. Um, I know that I'm getting more and more potential clients asking me questions all the time, every day. Hey, this video saved me, that video saved me. I love hearing that. I want you guys to be educated and hopefully through that education, you make the right choices. Um, whether you go with me or you go with another vendor, make sure they're qualified, make sure they actually have the skill set they claim to. And again, eliminate content creators from producing content that is once again done incorrectly, especially in this field. We're seeing it more and more, guys, and these videos reflect it. I mean, you can check the user's manual as I'm doing in these videos and see most of the actual techniques used and discussed are not even followed nor are they understood. So please be careful. Take care.